program tours that I've been attending for the past 10 years here in Palm Springs has been the key inspiration behind Hampton's 20th Century Modern. And this morning I'd like to share with you a little of what is, uh, is happening on my side of the world. Uh, before that, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm sure you can hear an accent. I grew up in Perth, West Australia. My father was an architect and I discovered my passion for architecture from him. Perth in the 70s and 80s was similar in vibe to California and the Hamptons uh, with its dry climate, agriculture, vast coastline, surfers, and its love for the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> Architecturally, we riffed off modernism inspired by the Mediterranean, a lot like some of the houses I will show you today. And when I see these houses, either here in Palm Springs <clears throat> or in the Hamptons, it gives me a warm, tingly feeling for my childhood. Oh. Uh, I've lived in the U.S. since 95. I'm an interior designer uh, based in the Hamptons uh, for the past 12 years, and I worked throughout the United States. I also worked in fashion for 30 years before that, but if I was to talk about fashion, I'd probably have to lay down on that sofa and have an analyst sitting in that chair. <laughs> uh, where are we? So I also want to quickly plug a talk on the 26th, on I Went, I Went Off, Jack sitting in the audience, an architect who designed some incredible houses in Perth during that time, and I would recommend you all to attend. Uh, the houses that he designed are phenomenal, and you will enjoy seeing them. Uh, so, where are the Hamptons? Uh, today I'll talk about roughly 45 miles of land between West Hampton Beach, and Montauk, which is located about two hours by car outside of New York City on Long Island, South Fork. Um, between the 1950s and 80s, some incredible modernist architecture by some of America's top architects had been built and subsequently destroyed by developers who were building these huge McMansions, as we like to call them. An average house size in the old days probably wouldn't have been any bigger than <clears throat> you know, around 1,800 square feet on three acres of land. Uh, now, they start at around 8,000 square feet on an acre. You know, the Hamptons is quickly turning into an overdeveloped suburb with row upon row of houses. You know, unfortunately, losing part of its charm, some of which is directly related to the modernism I want to talk about today. Uh, so how did it start? Funnily enough, a friend of mine who's sitting in the audience today gave me a book, and it was called Houses of the Hamptons. And it was written by Paul Goldberger. It was published in about 1990. And Paul was the uh, architectural critic for the New York Times for many years. He was also the critic at The New Yorker. He's written numerous books. He's also a resident of Amagansett and a, a big uh, person behind modernism. Uh, and saving it. So um, <clears throat> this friend of mine gave me this book in Palo Alto, I was on a job, and uh, I remember vividly, I was sitting in <laughs> the passenger seat of a car, he gave me this book, he found it in a sale bin in Palm Springs. And uh, I started flicking through this book, and I was like, wow, these houses are really incredible, right? But then what I also realized was that I knew more about houses in Palm Springs that I knew about what was in my backyard, right? And that kind of really surprised me. And so um, around, this was in January of 2020, and uh, in about March, well, as we all know, the pandemic, uh, it was about, I was in the middle of, it was in the middle of March, <clears throat> I think I'd eaten about five chocolate cakes. I was freaking out like I think a lot of us were about what was going on in the world. And I was like, where's that book? <laughs> you know, so I went and I searched and I found the book and I, um, I took some pictures with my iPhone and I posted uh, the Lloyd's House, uh, which was built in 1977 by Norman Jaffe. And I was like, wow, this house is so cool. I love it. And then quickly after, uh, someone posted, Oh yeah, we tore that one down last year. And, um, 
And you know, you know, there's that thing where you don't know how someone's saying something, whether it's in a text or a letter, right? He could have been, he could have been like, oh, we tore it down. But in my mind, it was like, yeah, we tore it down, who cares? You know, we built this huge mansion. They did, they built a huge mansion on it. Uh, so I was like super, super, super shocked that someone would tear this house down. So it was sold in 2013 under asking price, um, and it was destroyed in 2016. Uh, I w one interesting thing is uh, I met one of the builders to this house. Um, he was a young guy at that time when he built it. And uh, a little couple of side bits, the owner hated the dining room because it was so hot during the day he could never sit in it. And then the other part, an interesting thing about this house is you see these stone walls. Well, they weren't built with any foundation. So a couple of years into this house, they had to go in and do some maintenance, and there was a lot of mold already growing inside of some of these walls, which is sort of something that <clears throat> a builder would love to bring up for a reason to knock these houses down, right? They'll say, well, it wasn't built well, it didn't have a foundation, it's, it's cheaper if you just tear it down, right? And that's not what we want to do. So there's another view of the dining room. So, after freaking out so much, I uh, did some research and discovered that there was a gentleman by the name of Alistair Gordon. And Alistair Gordon is really the go-to guy on anything Hamptons. He's written numerous books on Jaffe, Geller. Uh, he wrote a, a book called Weekend Utopia. And he, uh, I managed to find his phone number and email. And I emailed him out of the blue. Again, I know nothing about modernism. and. Um, in fact, I think I'll, I'll, in my, an, an embarrassing note is when I emailed him the first time, I, I mentioned Andrew Geller, uh, one of the architects, when I spelled his name wrong, and his wife emailed me back blasting me for spelling his name wrong. But anyway, Alistair got back in touch with me, and, and uh, we were talking, and I'm like, so I'd love to get involved, you know, and join a committee, and maybe give some money, and show up at a... I don't know, benefit every now and then, and he's like, well, there isn't any. There aren't any benefits. These houses aren't protected. There's no one doing anything. Because I kind of thought it, there'd have to be something like what's happening here in Palm Springs. Um, and he's like, if you're gonna do anything, you better do it now, right? And I vividly remember him saying that to me, and, and for me, that was really sort of my call to arms, really. It was like, I could not do something, um, or, or, you know, and I really kind of do this in my father's name, you know, him uh, being an architect. So I thought, okay, so what, what, what do you do? Middle of March in 2020 is I just, um, you know, I, I started up a website, uh, I got a Squarespace, you know, and did that in a day, uh, you know, got the name sorted out, I did an Instagram page, and sort of we were off and running. And that's literally how this all started. And you could really call me an accidental preservationist, because it really wasn't how I was doing it. It wasn't what I was planning on doing. But a little bit about sort of the history of modernism in the Hamptons. And there's this massive connection between the modernist um, artists that were coming out to the Hamptons around the Great Depression and uh, around uh, the Second World War. And they all sort of had this incredible community in the Springs, you know, when we had like some of the most incredible major artists of that time, you know, like Jackson Pollock probably being, you know, the most well-known um, uh, amongst others. So there was this, and then the architects started mixing with them. Right, and they, they really started feeding off one another. You know, there was this bright world ahead, and, and anything could happen, and you could design whatever you wanted. And one of those people was Peter Blake, and Peter Blake was very good friends with um, Jackson Pollock, and Peter had been born in Berlin in the 20s, and uh, he was schooled in England when the Nazis came to power, and then he moved to the US in about 1944. He enrolled at the University of Pennsylvania and worked for Louis Kahn briefly. Uh, Blake was, like I said, good friends with Jackson Pollock. He was also good friends with Charles Ames. And he really loved the Hamptons art scene. 
One of the first houses he ever did was Russell House in Watermill, and this was built in 1956. An average house price point to build in those states was around $6,000, but they wanted this house insulated for year-round use because a typical house back in those days, it would open Memorial Day, and then you know they would close up at Labor Day, and that's pretty much the season in the Hamptons. So most of them weren't winterized, but they wanted this winterized, so it was around $12,000. Blake called this the upside down house, and that was because the bedrooms were on the first floor, and then all of the living and viewing were on the second floor. Um, you can see here, you know, there's this lovely big lawn, and everyone's out there enjoying the sun. Um, this is the house today. It was taken, so when I started up, I started going around and taking pictures of as many houses as I could. So this is uh, May of 2020, and probably that house would have been on about three acres. Now, I, I'd say it's barely on a quarter acre. Uh, it's probably seen brighter days. Uh, one of the few good points is the fact that it's still actually there. Um, Blake had designed this in partnership with another very notable architect called Julian Nesky, uh, and Julian and Barbara Nesky were incredible architects out there during that time. So the view's gone, there's no lawn, uh, there's a big mansion this side of the house and on the other side, and it's completely boxed in. Um, this is a very simple looking house, but if you were to ask Alistair Gordon sort of what was probably one of the key houses in the house, he'd say this house because of its legacy and its importance. The Blake house was Peter's house. This is quite a famous image um, that's been used a lot, and there you can see his family on the front deck. Uh, in Meacox Bay, you've got the water, beautiful waterline. That's the book Weekend Utopia by Alistair Gordon. It's a great book. I highly recommend you pick it up. Um, this is the house probably taken about uh, five or so years ago. It's still there. We're, we're just happy that things are still there, to be honest. Uh, the house went on the market, I think in about 2019. Um, and when after I got to know Alistair a bit, he'd call me every now and then and say, what's going on with the Blake house? Is it still there? And um, I was often too scared to go and look to see in case it had been torn down because that, that right there where that red arrow is pointing is a prime piece of real estate. The only reason that house is still there is because it's on a wetland. Um, I have a house from 1972 that's on a wetland and it's literally the only reason my house exists. And it's one of the few uh, key things that we have to save a house, is that if it's on a wetland, we, we, have, we stand a chance of protecting a house. The large Mediterranean looking house with the red terracotta roof, that was the owner. She purchased the house in the end and she's, she's keeping it as like, a, like, a, like an art space or like a, a place for friends to go and crash in. So the good news was it was saved, right? Because uh, that should have, that was so close to being torn down. Um, the pinwheel house was built in Watermill. And what was really interesting in, about this uh, pinwheel house is he took this philosophy and he was going to actually build a gallery for Jackson Pollock. And the whole idea of this was that it was a series of these sliding doors, right? These walls that you could open and close to allow in as much or as little light or air as you wanted. So we'd actually designed this, and it's worth looking up on uh, and Googling it, but this Jackson Pollock library was gonna be a series of these sliding glass walls that were on, it's gonna be built over the marshland in front of his house. I mean, it was so cool, but it never unfortunately got built. There's the house today. Could probably do without that nasty looking hot tub, but you know, there, it's, it, again, it's still there. God bless it, you know. And um, going on to another uh, art, architect from that time is um, one of everyone's favorites, and that would be Andrew Geller. And Andrew was born in he was a, he was born in Brooklyn in 1924, and he studied architecture at Cooper Union. Uh, New York Times said he helped bring modernism to the masses and was the, did the blueprint for the modern house for everyone. Um, Leisureama was a line of inexpensive prefabricated houses which were available for purchase through Macy's department stores. 
in the United States in the mid 60s. The final design was shown at the 19, uh, I have my glasses on, <laughs> 1959 American National Exhibition in Moscow. Over 200 uh, Leisurama houses are part of the Collagen Point Vacation Home Development in Montauk. Uh, they were constructed between 1963 and 1965. Uh, these were quite modest, simple houses. Um, and you know, this was around the time where the middle class uh, was, you know, they were probably working and living in New York City and they just wanted a, an inexpensive place to come in the summer. Um, which uh, unfortunately is not what it's like today. Uh, but he's really known for the, if you would ask anybody about Andrew Geller, they would tell you that he, he was whimsical, uh, uninhibited in his um, architectural style. And this is a perfect example of it. This is the Pearl Roth House. It's also known as the Double Diamond. And uh, that was built in, um, in West Hampton Beach. Uh, and uh, here you can see it when it was first built, you can see where it's got its name, the, the Double Diamond. Uh, this house, uh, I don't know why, but Andrew built a lot of his houses right on the beach in the dunes. And um, here are some of the interiors. He had really clever ways of utilizing the space. I mean, it's like a, it's like a, just a really casual great beach house. So the original owner, uh, Pearl Roths, the son Jonathan, who inherited the house, realized that with all the nor'easters coming in and climate change, that they really had to move the house back off the beach. So what they did is they, they pushed the, they took the house, they lifted it up, and they put it right back closest to the road. And then between the road and the beach, they put in a pool, and then they put in a new structure. And, and to me, something that I want to really share with you is this is the sort of thing that we, we go to prospective people who might have an important house on their property but you know they might want to tear it down because it's not going to suit their needs, right? So this is an example of, okay, you can still keep the house, all you gotta do is move it to a certain another area of the property and it makes a really great pool house or it makes a really great guest house. And, um, and you still have plenty of square footage allotment to build a new structure. And uh, so that, that's sort of an, an important thing I like to stress to anyone who's thinking of like buying, either buying a property, uh, you know, just thinking of tearing it down. Uh, the Reese House too was built in uh, Bridgehampton. And um, what was interesting with this, here you can see Andrew on the deck, it was built in 1963, and you can see these really interesting shaped windows, I'll tell you a little bit, bit about those. <laughs> but the, it was built for uh, Elizabeth Betty Reese. Here you can see her in the chair with her friends hanging out, probably playing some jazz. Here's the house today. And what's really interesting with these windows is that they were inspired by fish gills, right? So he had these really interesting ways of bringing nature and, and all of these elements into his design. Um, there you can see how the interior of the house gives you this really beautiful um, interior look. The Lawrence and Laura Antler house uh, was built in the Springs in 1968. And it's really, they call it the Antler house. But Really, it should be called the Owl House because the uh, windows are shaped like that of an owl. Um, you can probably see that now. Um, this, this is a picture of the house taken probably in the 70s or 80s and uh, they had to replace the windows and of course they, you know, putting in new windows was expensive so they took out those, those beautiful windows and you know, just put in a regular window. So it's starting to lose a lot of its charm. And then in about 2018, um, it got a reprieve, and this really cool girl by the name of Blair Morantz and her husband, who directs Star Trek, uh, bought it, and they brought it back, and they uh, did a beautiful job. It won an award in 2020 for architectural uh, preservation. Uh, they put back the windows, they added, a bit, uh, they added a deck, but they literally kept the footprint as is. So the interior of the house, uh, much like the upside down house by Peter Blake, the bedrooms are on the first floor. You go up some stairs to the living area, 
And then on the top floor was uh, another little little bedroom up in the in the uh, roof line. But you know, this is sort of this is how people would you know would spend their summers, like in these casual houses, lounging around. You might have sand on your feet. Big deal. Uh, it was really just about relaxing, and and you know, you're not trying to impress your neighbors. Uh, it's just about chilling out, you know, and. Uh, another house is the greenhouse, which was built in 1968. I, it was really hard for me to find any information on this house. Um, it was owned by Arthur and Carol Green, uh, but it was really poorly run down. And about 2013, the owners that have it now, they purchased it. And they added about 2,000 square feet. It's also for rent. Uh, the Antler House and the greenhouse are both available to rent in the summer if you so wish to come and join us. Uh, I'm not sure why he designed the windows like this off the gable, but maybe it was to, you know, allow light in but not the sun. Um, you know, it's a, maybe it was for privacy. Uh, maybe you didn't need to have any blinds on your windows. And I'm not sure, but here you see they did a really cool restoration. Again, super beachy, um, bless you, and great and great window lines. Um, so from Andrew, uh, probably one of the favorites of, and well, most well-known architects in the Hamptons was Norman Jaffe. And Norman Jaffe was born in 1932 in Chicago. And after finishing school, he joined the military in 1954, serving with the United States Army Corps, Corps of Engineers in Japan during the Korean War. Uh, in 1956, Jaffe began studying architecture, later transferring to the University of California, Berkeley where he received his bachelor's degree in 1958. In 1961, he moved to New York and he to work for Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and later for Philip Johnson. Uh, Jackie had begun visiting Long Island in the 60s, and in 1973, he moved uh, his practice to Bridgehampton. Uh, he was extremely prolific during that period, and he was much in demand by you know the who's who of that time. Um, I know Alan Alver was uh, one of his clients. Alan Alver still owns his Jaffe house. Probably my most favorite, and there, there's a hundred favorite houses I have in the Hamptons, but I think this is probably my favorite, and it's the Gates of the Grove um, Synagogue in East Hampton. That was built in 1988. Um, um, Norman was of, of the Jewish faith. He started working on this in 1987. Uh, he gave his services for free. Uh, a, little in, a little info on where he got his design from. It was taking the basic architectural frame from the Hoopa or Portico. Uh, this synagogue was a replacement for an existing wood frame building. Uh, the Jaffe addition is connected to an existing memorial grove of trees. Uh, the entryway is low in scale and tight in width, designed to help worshippers shed their daily concerns and prepare for prayer. Uh, the stone floors are laid in an irregular pattern, pattern with minimal joints, recalling limestone blocks of the Jerusalem walls. Uh, the portico theme begins at the entry and repeats in a series of interlocking ascending porticos that come to full height at the center. The ark is the last portico of building in itself. The angular columns recalling the character of Hebrew spirit bending upwards. Jaffe's design uh, won an award for contemporary religious design in 1989. Quite incredible. Uh, another house of his is Xanadu. Why it's called Xanadu, I have no idea. I don't know if it's because of Olivia Newton John or uh, Kubla Khan. Uh, but this was built in 1981. And you know, you may have noticed a lot of these houses I'm showing you have these sort of like really beautiful fields around them and like there's no one else and you could look for miles and not see another house. That is completely not the situation anymore. This house would be completely surrounded by other, by other houses. Uh, an interesting thing about Xanadine was it was one of the few times that Jaffe used terracotta tiles for the roofs of his house. I guess that was in vogue during that period. Um, the present owners purchased this house in about 10 or so years ago. And um, they were really smart. What they did is they just, they just replaced the roof line with a wood uh, shingle and then they left it for a while and then they had a designer by the name of Wesley Moon 
who they work uh, with in, in New York City, and they brought him out. Um, and uh, he started working on, on bringing this house back to life. And um, I love what he did. I think it's, he took a lot of the colors um, from the stone that was in the original house and used it for all of the furnishings. Um, it, to me, he did a beautiful job. Uh, one of the cedar paneling on the interior was just you know your classic cedar paneling. So what he did is they stripped it right back. Excuse me, and they stripped it right back and they put a, a gray wash on it, which to me gives it this really kind of cool bunker kind of vibe. Um, I added this picture because Jaffe's houses are sometimes a little head scratching because he'll he'll design these amazing foyers and living rooms and you walk in and you get this massive wow moment and then you'll go and look at the bedrooms and you'll scratch your head because literally it's really hard sometimes to find a wall that you can put a king size bed against and a nice bed on each side. They're all like these really weird angles and you're kind of like wow and the closets were really small um, <clears throat> but I mean the guy was a genius. Um, the Peter Cohen house this was built in 1982, uh, and this house was built on just a piece of flat um, farmland. And one of the first things that Jaffe did was he, he wanted to put in this man-made lake so that his architecture could reflect off the water. Um, a lot of Jaffe houses, they tend to really become part of the landscape. I think a lot in the way that Frank Lloyd Wright's house is really blended with the landscape. Jaffe really focused a lot on making sure that the house was part of the environment. Um, here you can see another image of that incredible living room. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that yellow arrow, but that's the, that's the leading, that takes you down to the front door. So the thing with Jaffe was, he was really kind of like the puppet master or the orchestra leader. He was gonna, he was gonna show you a house the way he wanted you to see it. Right? You couldn't just veer off some way and enter the house another way. He was literally directing you on how you were going to see the house. So for instance, you had to walk down those cantilevered steps to the front door. You had to walk past that waterfall. You had to go through a small entrance that was built within the stone. And then you had to go up uh, another flight of stairs and then you would come into the great room. Right? So he was like controlling how you were seeing proportion. So you would walk into this room and you'd be like, wow, you know, <laughs> this is amazing. And, uh, and it's, it's here you can see another view of the, um, of the living room. And I always feel like Jaffe houses are, they're very cinematic, you know, and they're very kind of like James Bond, villain Larry, you know, super cool. And, um, Speaking of James Bond and villain Lairs, the next guy we're going to talk about is Myron Goldfinger. <laughs> Had a nice leeway, right? Yeah. So Myron um, grew up in Atlantic City. He was a New Jersey born. He studied under Lewis Kahn at the University of Pennsylvania in 1955. He also worked for Skidmore, Mo Owings, and Merrill. They almost, all of the people that I'm talking about today, they almost all started at, at that Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And then he also moved to Philip Johnson uh, from 1963 to 1965. Myron opened his own firm in 1966, and he wrote a book called Villages in the Sun in 1969. And I mentioned that because it's all about Mediterranean architecture. And uh, this is a picture you can see of Thera in Santorini. I don't know how many of you have been there. We've got some few people. He named his daughter, one of his daughters, Thera. In fact, Myron is still alive at 92 and uh, bright as a whip. Uh, and uh, when you think of Mediterranean architecture, you think about all the stucco and you think about the shapes of the domes and um, the lack of windows and, you know, because it would be so hot during the day that, they, you know, they close all their windows to keep the cool air in. Um, and Myron really used that in his architecture. And what I'm about to show you next completely blew my mind when I saw this, because I've never seen anything like this in my life. And this is the luxury liner, and this was built in 1981. 
I was just like, I literally, I was like blown away when I saw this house. I was like, where are the windows? <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is the, this is sort of the back of the house. And the, the only reason you have three windows there is because the, the owner specifically asked for some windows in the kitchen so that they could see who was walking, you know, coming down the driveway. So you have the, you have some windows in the kitchen and then you have the main entrance. Uh, here is a, a, a smaller view of the front of the, uh, the well, either the, I guess the front of the house, which would be the beach side. Uh, but I mean, sculpturally, I've never seen anything like it. It just really, it was amazing. Here are some of the interiors. Um, this house had a very interesting resurgence a few years ago, because it ended up in the Wolf of Wall Street. And I don't, I don't know if you remember that scene, you know, it's where um, Jonah Hill's trying to say Steve Marston for about five minutes. And uh, this is that, it's seen there, and so they used Myra's house. He had no idea that the house was going to be in the movie. Um, but you can see here where all the window lines are, you know, there was a lot of skylights to, to allow the, the um, to let the light in. Uh, you know, a lot of people might find these types of houses like not their style, right? And what's interesting, is, like, for me, this is like more my my era. You know, I always I always feel like mid-century houses. Everyone loves them. Like you know, say late '90s, wallpaper started bringing coming out with these really cool mid-century houses and then mid-century furniture became popular um, and it's it's palatable and quite easy to you know appreciate someone once said to me which what's your favorite house in the Hamptons and I just without thinking I said it's the one no one likes because you know having come from fashion people's tastes change right and so we all love modernism we love a good 50s and 60s house, but there might come a day, say in 10 years time, where we're gonna be starting to look at like 70s brutalism more, we're gonna be looking at 80s, you know, God forbid, postmodernism, and it would be a real shame if in 10 years time, we don't have any houses left to talk about. So that's, that's really a sort of a key um, element to sort of what I'm trying to um, share, you know, and talk about. The Temple in the Dunes uh, was built in Southampton in 1985, and this is a lot like the houses that I grew up with, right? So this, this is the house actually during construction. It was built for, I think it was a lawyer by the name of, it was Robert Connison and his wife, Leslie. Robert never went to the house. Leslie, his wife, worked with um, Myron on this house. It had a deck on, each side, it was on Meadow Lane, uh, which is a, probably one of the top pieces of um, real estate in Southampton. Um, you had ocean views on one side, and then you had a, a, the beautiful marshlands on the other. Um, about eight or so years later, they added a further uh, extension to the house with the breezeway walking between it. Uh, they, they, Leslie had wanted a, an interior pool um, and then, then they added a, a suite. I, I asked Myra, and I was like, so are there like drapes and curtains in this house? <laughs> like, what do you do when you wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning and the sun's flaring through the window? It's like, you know, they, they were fine. They didn't, you know, they, 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 didn't, they didn't care, you know. Um, they had very good air conditioning. That's what he did say. Um, so then from Myra, and I, I want to talk about Charles Guasme and <coughs> He attended the University of Pennsylvania also, and he received his uh, Master of Degree in uh, Architecture in 1962 from the Yale School of Architecture. He also won both the William Wirt Winchester Fellowship as the Outstanding Graduate and the Fulbright Grant. Uh, while at Yale, he had studied under Paul Rudolph. Probably the most famous of uh, Guatemala's houses was his parents' house which is also, as you can see, was the inspiration for the logo for our um, organization. And this was Guafmi's first ever design. And um, when he designed this for his parents and they went to get bids for it, the bids came in at around $70,000, which was a lot of money back in 1967. And so he ended up 
being the contractor and builder for the house himself. So he actually built the house as well as designing it. And he did this all before he uh, was a licensed architect. And there's, a, there's quite a famous story around that because when Charles went to sit for his architectural exam, uh, he was sitting in the exam room with about 1,200 other young people, erstwhile, he called them, and uh, they all turned the page at the same time and there was a question. On one, and the question was, which of this, these houses is an example of organic architecture? And the, one of the first house was the Muse van der Rohe house. The second house was Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright. And the third house was this house. <laughs> so, I mean, he, uh, he really wanted to put you know, say that his house was the was the was the organic architect, but he, he, he knew he put down Paul and Walter. And of course he got it right. But I mean how incredible to not even be licensed and to be, you know, part of an exam, I mean just incredible. A few years later they added a, a studio. Uh, both of his parents were artists and uh, the studio was built at a forty five degree angle to the original house. Um, there's a house on the side there on the right that I'm going to talk about next. Here's a few images of the interior. Um, it's quite tranquil and beautiful. Uh, the house next door is called the Tolan Residence, and this was built for Michael Tolan, who was a bachelor in the 70s. This was built in 72. He, he was in film and television. I think he was a producer and an actor and a director. And, um, you know, he asked Charles to design a house that the center, center shaft was for a uh, living room and his quarters, and then there would be a, a wing off the side, and that would be for his uh, guests. And on top of that would be a big sort of sun deck, right, that would have privacy. And the other part of it that he wanted was the tennis court. Um, this was taken from a magazine published around the house when it was first built. and. <laughs> There's, do you see the bed up on the, up on the right? Mm -hmm. So Charles did this really interesting thing and he did it more than once and he actually put it in his own house. He would take a piece of furniture like a bed and he would either turn, say, the headboard into a, uh, a set of drawers, like a, a closet, and sometimes he would turn uh, the footboard into a closet or the footboard might be a desk. And another thing he would often do is he would take the bed and he would stick it in the middle of the room so that you would walk around the room 360 degrees, which I found really, really interesting because there's so many sort of rules, right, when it comes to um, furnishing a bedroom and a bedroom layout. Like, you know, you've got to have the bed against the wall, you need to have a nightstand either side of it, they've got to be the same nightstand. And Wasmi really sort of came up with his own dialogue on, on furniture. In fact, I, um, I've used this idea a lot. In fact, I have it in my house right now, but um, I had a house once where um, it had a really weird shaped bedroom, so I put the bed in the middle of the room. I left, I, had, <laughs> I left the house, the cleaning lady came in. And when, and when I came back about two hours later, she pushed the bed back into the corner of the bedroom. You know, it's just it's like <clears throat> thinking about, oh, you know, it has to be this way, right? It doesn't have to be that way at all. You can do whatever you want. Um, so a few years ago, they, um, the owners hired an architect by the name of Nick Martin. And Nick was, uh, was, had actually worked for Guelphie. He has a very successful practice in the Hamptons. And uh, he came in and updated it. And, uh, you know, really kind of made it into a, a more green space, right? More in keeping with energy efficiency in the 21st century. Here you can see a really cool image of the back of the house. He added a Houdini channel window in the bathroom. He added some sliding doors um, out into the tennis court. He added that rail, that beautiful rail on the staircase upstairs. Um, there was initially, you know, a lot of those houses in the, those days, especially, in, I don't, I'm not so sure about here, but a lot of them had spiral staircases. So what they did, what the owners, what, they took out the spiral staircase and the husband's wife was Russian and she wanted a plunge pool and like a sauna. So they, they added some additional elements to that, uh, to the wing. 
Um, and then I got to visit the house um, a couple, two or three months ago. And uh, here I am, I'm climbing up the stairs. It's a gray, gray day in the Hamptons. Coming around, I'm looking down, that's in, looking down into the living room. <laughs> And what I'm really jumping to get to is uh, right over here is the parents' house, which blew my mind. That's the first time I'd ever seen that house in my life. You can see the deck there that they would sunbathe on, the tennis court. And in the background, that's the studio of Rothney's parents. So that, that really blew my mind. Um, people sometimes say to me, oh, so what do you get out of this? Why are you doing it? You know, what's the benefit? For me, it's literally I get to go into some of these houses, and that's all I need. I just, I, I want to see these houses. And I, I, you know, probably like a lot of you, it really affects you um, to the core when you see going in these houses. It's such an incredible experience. Um, from, so there's some of the architects I wanted to talk about today. There are definitely other architects. Um, and, Moving over, there was this article called Saving Modernism in the Hamptons. It came out sort of May of last year. And uh, it was a great article. We got a lot of really positive feedback from it. I posted it on Instagram, and someone said to me, have you read the comments <clears throat> on the article? I was like, what do you mean? There's comments? And um, so, uh, you know, Beyonce said never scroll, but I scrolled. And um, there were a lot of really, really positive comments. But there were a few comments that came up that I had never thought about. One of them was, hey, it's a bunch of rich people, who cares? The other one was, it's their house, it's their land, they can do whatever they want with it. The other one was, all these houses were built really poorly anyway, so why not just tear them down? And then lastly, modernism's ugly and uh, shouldn't, be, <laughs> shouldn't be here. You know, and, and so, I, there were really valid questions and thoughts that I'd never really thought much about. And I spoke to George Smart from US Modernist. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I was like, so, so how do we save these houses? And he's like, well, the best thing we really need to do is educate people, like PR these houses, make, you know, get people excited about these houses, show these houses, explain to people why these houses are cool, which is what I'm trying to do today. And, um, really work with the owners, right, um, when, they, when they're coming on the market, and, um, and sort of working with them to, to find custodians, right, that are gonna take these houses and, and look after them and not tear them down. Um, to, speaking of tearing down, you know, we have a lot of houses that are getting demolished. This one is one of my favorites. It's by Todd Williams. It's this really weird, quirky house, but it was the first house he ever designed, um, Rachel Williams, his daughter would tell me he would, they would sleep on the laundry floor while the dad was building the house and it was surrounded by potato fields and all these stories and it's getting demolished. Was me. This is like house after house after house. Uh, unfortunately, this is sort of what we're dealing with. But I don't want to end on a, on a downer. Um, <clears throat> There was a house, it was called the Bliss House by Norman Jaffe, and we semi-saved it. Um, it's presently at the uh, Suffolk Supreme Court. Uh, but about a year ago, uh, the Long Island Preservation Society called me and said, hey, did you know that there's a Jaffe up for demo at Southampton um, Architectural Review Board? And I was like, no, I had no idea. So I went along to this meeting. Um, I did a little presentation. I um, I showed them Xanadu and sort of did some boards and said, well, you know, you don't have to tear it down. You can keep it and you can modernize it. And there are some other architects that were there as well, and they spoke. Um, Alistair Gordon wrote a letter. Uh, Paul Goldberger wrote a letter. And um, we managed to get the house. Uh, they denied the application to tear it down, which was the first. That, that hadn't really happened before. So, I mean, it was like really, really incredible. The, the lawyer was furious uh, for, and uh, the, just quickly about this house. This house was designed in about 1978, 1979, and the head of the Architectural Review Board during that period was a staunch traditionalist. He hated modernism. 
And one of the, his excuses for not building it was that birds would impale themselves on the, on the roof. <laughs> Literally, that was his best argument. And so they, you know, God bless Mr. Bliss, he pushed and pushed, and they finally agreed under the, under the uh, one thing that he had to do was the landscaping had to completely cover the, uh, you couldn't see the house from the street and you couldn't see the house from the road. And that would be in perpetuity, right, forever. And so he agreed and they built the house. And then, uh, you know, for some reason last year he wants to tear it down. Um, so that's, that's sort of, you know, something that happened last year that, uh, you know, was a little ray of light. I'll end on, I mentioned preservation on Ireland. Um, and what we're doing, what we've done is, we've come up with this list of 50 houses my house is that little black house on the corner down there. And, um, and uh, what it is, is th there's this list, it's called the Chris List, which is the cultural resource system. So what we do is we've taken these 50 houses, we, we're punching them into this list. Uh, we, we're adding pictures, we're adding um, who the architect is, its features, its importance, and a tax ID number. And a tax ID number is really important because when any, anybody uh, goes to uh, want to get a permit to demo, they have they punch in the tax ID number, right? And so what will happen is when they punch in the tax ID number for any of these 50 houses, it's going to come up. And it's not going to save them, but at least it will start a dialogue, right? Of saying, well, maybe this house is really, you know, something we need to look into further before we approve a demolition. Um, and then I'll just end on, I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning I said, um, you know, one of the things I want to do was uh, home tours. So we had our first home tour last year. We had about six or seven houses on it. It was a huge success. We sold all our tickets. We made a bit of money. No one sued me. Um, and all the houses were, I managed to find like six, seven houses that all had a black exterior. And uh, it was a really great day. And we're doing another one this year. Um, and it will, you know, hopefully this is the beginning. So that's sort of, <clears throat> that's my talk. And I, I, you know, I'd really love to hear any questions that uh, anyone may have on, uh, on this. Yeah.